to me, you've got to understand that data now is worth more than oil. Um, so they're going to put a lot of money into securing that, and they're going to put a lot of money into defending that. Now, I'm genuinely proud of, of living in England and in Britain because we have some of the best security professionals in the world. But you have a lot of threat actors as well. So you've got China, you've got Russia, you've got North Korea, you've got all the states that wouldn't necessarily get on with us politically. And you have to understand that for the price of one fighter plane, you can hire 200 hackers. So information warfare is going to be the future of war. I am joined by Tom Johnson, ethical hacker and social engineer extraordinaire. Welcome to the show, Tom. It's great to have you on. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's going to be an exciting one today. This world of ethical hacking and social engineering is something that I've seen a little bit about online, but I don't really know all that much. But I guess we're going to, we're going to delve into it today, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, would you like to start off at the beginning, how I got involved in it? Yeah, absolutely. Or would you like me to tell you what it is, first <laughs> of all? <laughs> so, yeah, let's, <laughs> let's, let's find out. How do you define ethical hacking and, and social engineering and what you do? And then, and then let's find about, out about the, uh, the Genesis story. Absolutely. Okay, so social engineering, according to a guy called Christopher Hadnagy in America, is the art of using human psychology or misusing human psychology to get a target to do something or say something they shouldn't do or say. And that is grassroots. So if you can talk someone into giving you the passwords or plugging a USB stick into the computer, then all of this very expensive sort of cyber security mitigation is useless because they are literally giving you the keys to the kingdom. So that, in a nutshell, is what it is. I understand. Yeah, I suppose as these uh, technological firewalls and safety measures become more sophisticated, the uh, ways around it that don't require you to just brute force try and break through something that's heavily encrypted, I guess this sort of falls to the, the one remaining weak link in the chain, which is always going to be the the several million year old brain that sits inside of the person controlling the system, right? <laughs> well, uh, in my opinion, humans can be the weakest link, but they can also be the strongest link as well, because they think in a different way to how computers process information. So have you ever had a gut feeling before, Chris? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that gut feeling is your subconscious mind telling you that there is something not quite right in a pattern. So your subconscious mind is constantly processing everything around you. And then when you get that gut feeling, that is your subconscious mind saying to your conscious mind, there's something not quite right here. So that is a really good way to defend against social engineers, that okay. gut feeling. Got you. Okay, so let's start off the Genesis story. How do you... So what happens whereby you are now sat opposite me with a microphone in front of you talking about ethical hacking and social engineering? Where does it begin? Right. It begins when I was about 12 years old and I was pulled out of school by an overprotective mother. Um, I was a very small child in a predominantly council area in Wall's End. Um, and it wasn't a very good time at school for me. And she was very overprotective, pulled me out and had nothing to give me work-wise. So she just sat me in front of a computer. So I started playing games, what every child tends to do. And then I started getting bored of games um, and I couldn't afford new games. So I started working out how I could break the system and copy those games so I could get them for free. Not because I was a criminal, but because I wanted to play games. Uh, the games started getting boring. So I wanted to learn how the games worked. So I'd program the games. Um, and things developed on and on and on. And then something amazing happened. This rudimentary thing called the internet come about and it become my playground. Um, I was spending all of my time online. Um, I had no moral or ethical compass at that point in time. I was young. I wasn't a bad lad, but I'd done things because I was a bit mischievous. So I would hack random computers on the internet and download through all the, look through all the files. And then it started getting boring. So I started going a bit further. I started college. Um, I got thrown out of college for hacking an internal mail system. <laughs> I was, <laughs> yeah, it was naughty, but I was sending messages from one lecturer to another saying that they were in love with each other or, 
all, all sorts of different things. <laughs> getting some is. funny looks. Yeah. I was great at doing things, but terrible at getting away with them. Ah, so I got yeah. caught and, and thrown out of uh, college. So I went back again. I lasted about two weeks and I was thrown out again. Um, I locked the network manager out of his computer and he didn't see the funny side. <laughs> so you've got to understand at the same time, I, I, my skills were developing um, to a point where college wasn't really teaching me anything. So I was a bit bored, if that makes sense. So it just sort of encouraged me to do more and more risky things, silly things when I look back. I'm a white hat now. May I just add that? A white hat is somebody who puts ethics over morals, over everything. So I will only act within the boundaries of law. But in those days, anything online was fair game. Um, I was running my mother's phone bill up because, of course, it was on dial-up at the time. <laughs> um, she used to put a little um, key code on, so I wrote a little program that would go through every single key code and, and brute force it. So within an hour, I was back online again. And then one day, I heard a knock at the door. I answered the door, and there was two big burly police officers standing in front of us. Um, they subsequently arrested me, took me to the police station, locked me up for about 15 hours, threatened to extradite me to America where I'd get death by lethal injection and everything. And I was absolutely terrified. How old were you, how old were you here? I was about 16, 17-ish. Shit, the bird. It's a young age and to be having I, such, a, such, such a heavy a words thrown at you. Slap about the head and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 20 years later, I found out it was a social engineer, an attack on us. It was actually two of my mother's friends who were coppers, who she put them up to the task of scaring me straight. So it wasn't a real arrest. Oh, no it was run our phone bill up. <laughs> so that was my first taste of, of um, social engineering. And believe you me, it was very effective. Wow. So did, that, then, did that scare you straight? It scared me straight for a very long time. In fact, I lost my love of computers for a while. Um, I, I took it hook, line, and sinker, and I was genuinely in fear of my life. Um, and, and I just stayed away from computers. I set up a company. Um, I don't know all right out of the company. And then that went under, and I just thought to myself, what do I want to do? Do I want to earn minimum wage for the rest of my life? So I looked at the skill set that I had. And I thought I want to go back into cybersecurity. Now it is a, a job. It wasn't back then. It was a crime. But now it's a job. So uh, I had no qualifications to be named. So I blagged my way onto a Teesside University course. Um, they give me a shot. And I've received a, a first with honours in every module so far. So I've done all right. Amazing. That's yeah. fantastic. So that's that's the journey that you've taken yourself on there. So how do you go from the online to the offline? Is it off offline hacking? Right. Yeah. Well, it's it's more in person. It, it's like it's like the the good old fashioned con. That's exactly what it is, but it's got a cyber element to it. Okay. So if you remember the old con men or con women who would trick you into doing something, that is exactly what social engineering can be. Mm -hmm. It's tricking somebody into doing something or saying something they shouldn't. So I set up a little company. Um, I started doing a little bit of work with the police, um, little bits and bobs here and there, um, and then I done a talk at Cyberfest. Have you heard of Cyberfest, the convention? No. It's, it's a north northeast convention, northeast of England. Um, and then I was invited from that talk um, to do a talk at the um, local government level. Now, the talk that I'd done was based upon a hack that I carried out, an ethical hack, on the university that I studied at. So I was a first-year student, bearing in mind when this took place, and I approached the School of Computing can I test your security, please? Mm. And they said yes. They didn't realise I'd been a hacker from being about 12 years old. Oh, did they just think that it was some some student who didn't really know what he was doing, didn't realise they were coming up against boss level 55 hacking skills? <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm that good. Uh, but yeah, they, they, they got a bit of a shock. Um, within 24 hours, I uh, worked out how their um, smart card system worked and I uh, built a cloner that could clone the cards. So I then dressed up as a security guard, and this is the social engineering side of things, put the high vis on, done me Superman changed, shaved me head, looked completely different, and then went round and skimmed all of the staff's cards. 
Um, and with those cards, I had access to all areas, free parking for six months, may I add, um, <laughs> free food, <laughs> free food um, library books, everything you could ever want was all there, free. Um, I didn't tell Teesside University until Cyberfest, which was a little bit naughty. Uh. Um, and then I sort of give away all the secrets and it got a little bit of attention. I bet it did, yeah. <laughs> it did. Um, but then I got invited to the ICDDF, the Information Communication Data and Digital Forensics Convention, which is uh, Europe's largest closed cybersecurity convention for uh, police, law enforcement and military. So I was invited by the National Police Chiefs Council to do a talk there. Real epicenter of, of this sort of stuff then. Absolutely, absolutely. It's about as big as you can get. Um, it was invite only, you know, you couldn't get through the doors unless you were invited. So I arrived, um, I expected to be shot in a little side room, just doing a little filler talk. And I was in the big county suite uh, and I was a keynote speaker. So it was absolutely terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to talk in front of 600 of some of the world's best professionals on cybersecurity and, and especially social engineering. Shit the bed. Absolutely. Do you want to see what I got as well? I got that. What's that? That's a plaque. Certificate of a Appreciation. Certificate. That's so cool. That's from. Is that it, from the Home Office? That's from the Home Office, yeah. Um, let me just see. I've got something else kicking about somewhere. Oh, there it is. Bear with me one moment. I've dropped it. This is even cooler. This is an honour coin that I was given, believe it or not, off the Home Office okay. and the FBI. Oh, so that's an AT and T, NTSC. This, what what does what does that mean, and what is it? It's like a big so plastic it, plastic coin. No, no, it's not. It's a metal coin. <laughs> metal coin oh, inside of a pla- inside of a it's plastic, in a plastic sleeve. container. See if I can get it out. All right, yeah, yeah. So what what um, does it mean? No, what it's it stuck. So this is what you call an honor coin, um, and it's what I was awarded for doing the talk. Um, and it, I'll show you. So that's the side there. That's the important one. Okay. That's uh, the National Police Chiefs Council, our central government, yeah, yeah. and um, the National Crime Agency. Got you. And on that side, we've got um, AT and T who sponsored the event. Got you. We've got uh, the Metropolitan Police, the British government. That little round one there yep. is the FBI Operational Technological Division. Fuck me. There's <laughs> some big names on this thing. Jeez. Yeah, and the bottom one is the National Technological Assistance Centre. So to me, that is like my valued possession. I've went from port scanning the FBI when I was a kid yep. to now sort of working alongside them. It was really exciting. Unbelievable. So off the back of this talk that you've given, presumably it's – it's been interesting to uh, quite a few people in the audience. What happens from there? Do you, is there any job offers? Do you get any emails? Is, is anyone? I'm getting a fair few job offers all the time. To be to be fair, um, but I'm currently putting them on hold. I've went on another journey now, which is the technical side. I'm currently studying uh, OSCP, which is Offensive Security Certified Professional Hacker. Um, I should receive that in two months, and then. The world is my oyster. What's that most recent qualification? What does that mean? Um, that is, we have an operating system. I mean, you see it just behind me here. Yep. That's a Kali Linux, which is not a Windows-based system. It's a it's a Debian-based system. And uh, offensive security to make Kali Linux have an accreditation called OSCP. Um, and it's called PWK, Penetration with Kali Linux. So once I get that, it's a, a globally recognised certification. Okay, and that is, like you said, on the technical side. So is it rare to find uh, hackers who have the in-person skills alongside the technical know-how, or do you find think- do you find do you find people who have that mindset with regards to just trying to open doors, whether it's online or offline, they're just interested either way? I think you have more technological hackers than you have social engineers. Um, Sorry, let's rephrase that. You have more good technical hackers than you have good social engineers. So every every hacker has the potential to attempt social engineering Mm -hmm. techniques and, and tactics, but some are better than others. 
Um, and, and it's relatively rare to find a nerd like myself with the ability to be able to talk to people as well. Mm-hmm. So I take pleasure in teaching and, and communicating and, and helping organizations. And that in itself helps me sort of sharpen my social engineering tool set. Um, I've recently done a hack on a, on a large unnamed company, mm-hmm. um, uh, an ethical hack. I was employed to test their security. Um, And part of my training them allowed me to advance my social engineering. And I'll explain that. I was, I was approached by this company and asked if I could test their human firewall. So I spent three, about three weeks exfiltrating information, um, doing reconnaissance on them, passive and active, finding out who the staff were, who they were talking to. Um, I trolled all of the Facebooks, the LinkedIn, all of the social media. I built up profiles on them. I prioritized five staff um, who I thought would be the weakest. And I approached them over LinkedIn for my pretext, which was my lie. So I tried um, multiple, I'll not go into the trade secrets, but I tried multiple lies and a couple of them were successful. I managed to, to hook a couple of them, but one I prioritized. I went in, I held a meeting with them pertaining to something that didn't exist um, and then left. And in that short amount of time, I had already cloned all of the cards to get into the building. Um, <laughs> so within 15 minutes of my actual um, exploitation phase, I was in their inner sanctum through multiple coded doors, drinking cups of coffee in their tea station for three and a half hours unquestioned. Um, it was it was good. It was interesting. It was is exciting. That, is that what you call a successful hack? Yes. Um, to, to be totally honest with you, they were very good on a lot of areas, um, but they, they, they just didn't expect an attack of that magnitude to take place. So the final straw was I was asking staff to step away from the computers and I was plugging in um, covert um, hacking tools like the USB rubber ducky and the bash bunny, which look like USB devices, but they aren't. Um, the, the tell, tools... us, tell us about those. I want to know what those do. Right. Well, uh, USB rubber ducky was created by a company called Hack5. Shout out to Shannon Moss and Darren Kitchen. Um, they created... Um, a device called an HID, a human uh, interface device. Now it looks to the computer like it's a keyboard with somebody typing on the other end, Okay. but it can type at thousands of characters a minute. So I could spend a full day coding exploits to, to compromise their systems. And then I plug this device in and it types it out locally Uh, on the system. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it, it thinks it's a person typing. And the Bash Bunny is an attack, a multi-attack platform um, which can emulate uh, Ethernet over USB, which is trusted by Windows, iOS, and Linux. Um, and you can run payloads, steal password hashes, do all sorts with it, even through a lock screen on a computer. Shit, the bit. Yeah. yeah. serious stuff. Oh, it gets worse. It gets worse. <laughs> oh, come on. I want to find out what are the other, what's the other like atomic weapons or what, if we were to open up the ethical hackers toolkit or the bag, what have you got inside of it? You've got the rubber ducky. I've, you've got I've the, got the bash, sort of, you've got the bash I've got, bunny. I've got some bits here if you want us to show you them. You can just Would run, you like me to show you them? You can just run through them if you want to. You can just run us through everything that would be in there. Right. Okay. Well, I've got them and I'll show you at the same time. Cool. So we've got um, little single board computers, Raspberry Pis, really useful. They run off a of battery. Uh, they've got Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and that's a full PC there. Okay. Um, but they do get smaller. You can get the little Raspberry Pi Zeros, which are absolutely so tiny. That's not much bigger than the size of a matchbox, but it's essentially a computer in your in your pocket. Pretty much, but they get even smaller. And that's that is one a full PC there. That is one which is probably the size of just bigger than a lighter, but totally two dimensional. Well, there's a USB stick. Yeah, it's about just a Raspberry. bit bigger than a USB stick. Yeah, wow. Yeah, so that's so you look at, yeah. So just standard USB sticks with uh, malicious software on them. Okay. Uh, yeah. You can you can generate malware, and then you can um, use a crypta like Veil Evasion to mask its file signature. Okay. So the antivirus 
systems don't pick up on it. Okay. So the very system that you use to protect you works against you because it doesn't flag you of any problems. And you, and you think that you're safe as well. So you're probably, you're probably a little bit more complacent about the security that you should have in place. Oh, well, even if someone does get through, the antivirus will catch it. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got a normal light, that cheapy six quid off eBay, really useful. It's got a little covert camera in the bottom of it. No And way. this bit comes off and it's a, it's a USB stick. Really handy, leave them in cigarette areas and stuff to, to record staff and then exfiltrate information from that. That's awesome. We've got this device that's held together with tape because I, I abuse it quite a bit. But this is a scary, scary device. Okay. Um, it, looks, I'll give you, it looks to me just like a motherboard encased in a plastic shell. It, it does, um, but it isn't. I'll explain what it is. It's actually, I'll give you two, two definitions. One, the tech definition, yep. and two, the, the everyday English definition. Got you. So this is a uh, software-defined radio transceiver operating from one megahertz to six gigahertz. Uh, and in English, yep. <laughs> it's, a, it's a radio transmitter and receiver that talks to technology. Okay. Um, but you can talk to Bluetooth with it. You can talk to Wi-Fi. Um, you can talk to NFC. You can talk to the little uh, readers on the doors that allows you into buildings. Okay. Um, you can talk to GPS with it. You can literally, with this device, snatch telephone calls out of the air, decrypt the conversation, and listen to both sides of the call. Oh Not that I would. It would be illegal, <laughs> but it's possible. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, what, so how does that does that need to be powered? Is it battery powered? How does that work? You just plug it into your USB port in your computer. Um, that powers it. It does eat the battery quite a bit. It's quite sort of hungry. power hungry. Yeah. Um, depending on which frequencies you're operating on, if you're operating on low frequency, there's less frames, so it's less power. If you operate on a high frequency, it's obviously squashes more data in, so it has to use more power to do that. So you need to be. Um, that particular device that you've just brought up there, does that need to be in the facility? Um, about 100 yards away. Okay. so you Depending can... on depend on what you're talking to. If it's low frequency uh, as opposed to high frequency, it depends on what you're talking to. If it's if it's a door lock, you need to be relatively close to the, the system. going to say but you can't you... just park the car outside and start doing stuff with that. Well, criminals use those very tools to steal cars. So they sit in as the car park and they run a, a, a sniffer and they literally capture um, the, the codes off the, the car keys. The older cars works with what you call a replay attack. So you literally just capture the, the door lock code and then replay it through the device and the doors on the cars would open. Um, but do you, have you seen all the modern cars that keep getting stolen with the people who stand outside of the houses with the antennas to look for the keys. So I've seen a blog post about it, but if you understand, Tom, it'd be great for you to tell the listeners because it's a really cool story. Well, it's called a, re uh, a relay attack. Sorry, not a replay attack, a relay attack. So what they do is they pretty much sit the device in between the car and the key in the house. And what they do is they scan with a, an antenna to... How, how it works is the car sends what you call a YGAN signal, which powers up the key. Mm -hmm. So when you come in, like get in range of the car, it powers up the key. The key responds. The car knows you knows that that's the, the correct key. So you sit there and you relay from the car to the key, the key to the car, mm -hmm. and then the car opens mm -hmm. and then they drive off with it. So that's how it works. I'm not going to tell you how it's done. Yep. Uh... There was a, <laughs> I saw a, um, I saw this blog post. I think it might have even been on Top Gear or something like that. And they were talking about some of these really new, fairly high, like a Ford Cougar or something else, like a pretty new 19-plate cars that were being stolen in under 30 seconds by using this sort of this sort of approach. Terrifying. Absolutely, because that car is, is firing this signal to power up that key. Mm -hmm. If that key's out of range, the car's locked. As soon as that key goes into range, it, it, it opens, but the, S, the SDR, the Software Defined Radio, is extending that range like a, like a relay runner. Yep, it's yep. passing that button, that signal backwards and forwards. Mm. So the car knows no difference. So for anyone that's listening, if you've got a, a vehicle which has got keyless entry uh, and engine start, how can they protect themselves? That's the question. <laughs> Um, store it in a biscuit tin on a night time. 
Um, it acts like a Faraday's cage. It stops the signal getting out. You can buy little wallets for the keys. Manufacturers are now looking at creating keys that um, disable themselves unless they actually move. So when you mm. move them and wobble them, they'll reactivate themselves. But it's just a matter of time before the black hats and the cyber criminals come up with ways around that, you know. Yeah. Clever stuff, really, really clever stuff. Yeah, that's really interesting. So we've got the the rubber ducky, we've got the uh, bash bunny, we've got the uh, that wireless the camera that's inside of a, a lighter is unbelievable. Literally just looks like a lighter and it's got a camera on the bottom of it. Uh, we've got your, your relay for getting stuff from the facility and sending that back in. Um, yeah. What else? What else have you got, or what else would you want to use if you were if you were needing to get a hack? Maybe stuff like uh, blank cards and stuff like that. I guess for replacing blank cards for using on access oh, panels. Blank cards, yeah, absolutely. Blank cards. You can pick them up from good old China for about twenty five pence each. Yeah. Um, and, and you can rewrite them and reprogram them anytime you want. Mm-hmm. Um, I use simple things like little button cameras. Really cheap. Buy them off eBay. Just shot them underneath your shirt, and then you can capture people. It's all good for um, listening to conversation at a later date. So things you may have missed, it might just be that one tiny little bit of information that you can use to leverage that person or that company. Um, I mean, I've tried everything. Uh, I've tried bribery. Go up to somebody and just say, look, let me into the building. I'll give you 200 quid. Mm -hmm. Um, You try everything within scope. So you have a, a document of scope set up by the company and they literally say what you can and what you can't do. And then you just try and leverage the information that you, you pull down. But we, we do all sorts of things like we check um, to see if emails have been involved in uh, data breaches. So if you register with a, a website and then that website gets hacked and your details get leaked, then we can check to see if those emails have been involved in data breaches and, and which data breaches have been involved in. Yeah. Um, I mean, for a, for a cyber criminal, it would take a minute and a half to download the entire Twitter database in plain text. If you know where to look, it's there. And that's that's pretty pretty scary, to be totally honest with you. Fucking hell. So um, LinkedIn had a data breach not so long ago. Uh, and a bunch of um, a bunch of logins uh, account information was taken from that. Mine was one of them. But one thing that I didn't do, although I have done now with a, a updated password protector. Shout out to One Password Tiago Forte's suggestion to me, which has been an absolute lifesaver. Um, I had the same password for LinkedIn as my Deliveroo. Um, no, I, I know. Don't I, share passwords. I know. I know. That was, a, that was a bad idea. And um, yeah. So I. I got a message woke up one morning for a message off my business partner and he said uh uh is this you ordering nando's in london on my card because his card was on my account i must have ordered some <laughs> for him so uh i was like no 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 not at all, not at all. Went i shouldn't on. laugh i'm sorry uh, it, 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 it wasn't my money it was his although he did he, he then did uh make sure that i was billed for it on the company account but uh yeah and they'd, sure enough they'd, they'd used my details and they must have just brute force checked a whole bunch of other platforms to see does this email and password combination appear on this 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 and sure enough on delivery it did and 45 Absolutely. quids worth of nando's later they'd they'd had it away that is social engineering 101 the human psychology make the way that you're wired makes it difficult to remember complex random passwords so what we do is we create something that we know most passwords have a capital first letter and have numbers at the end. Why? Because through school, we're taught to capitalize the first letter of a sentence. So when we're generating our password, we capitalize the first letter because we know it needs a capital. <laughs> we put the number at the end because it's at the end and we'll remember it. It's normally two digits or four digits, a date of birth or a memorable date um, or something simple like one, two, three, four at the end of the password. Passwords are normally constructed out of, if you're English, English words. Um, which can be found in a dictionary. Um, And it doesn't take very long to crack a password. The entire character set of eight characters, including uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and special characters in its entirety can be cracked in two hours now. So 
I mean, that just, yeah. if, if, if you're looking at longer passwords, if it's constructed of English words and numbers and letters, we use dictionary attacks. So we'll say, OK, we'll try dictionary one and dictionary two and we'll use a rule set to capitalise the first letters or not and put numbers at the end from one to 3,000. And then that reduces that character set down massively. So you can, you can crack a lot of passwords relatively quickly. Is that brute force stuff there where you just start, you'll set some sort of program away and it will just start cycling through version one, version two, version three, version four? No, brute force isn't very efficient. Uh, the eight character set, which I said can be cracked in its entirety, that is a brute force attack. Yes. As you start getting the nine, ten, it's inconceivably long. Yes. So what you do is you use rule sets yes. and dictionaries. Understood. So it's not a, a brute force. You're not going through like zero, 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 A, zero, zero, yep, yep, zero, yep, yep, zero, yep. A. But you, you're literally combining different words together and using sort of different numbers and rule sets alongside it. But a lot of people use, um, it's, it's called hackerish. It's where you substitute a, a letter for a number. So I becomes one, O becomes zero, mm-hmm. E becomes three. A lot of people use that in the passwords because it's easier to remember. But that's the first thing somebody's going to try. They're going to use a rule set to try that. So now we've got what you call GPU hacking, uh, sorry, cracking. We use something called Hashcat. And you can put together graphics cards, a number of graphics cards, which are very, very good at um, mathematics. So that they're much, much quicker than CPU cracking. So it's just, you know, it's, it's getting much, much tougher. Now, I can give you a really good hint. One pass, things like uh, password safes, they're all good and well, unless somebody gets your master password and then they've got the, all the keys to the kingdom. So you can create something called mnemonic password generation. Have you heard of that? No. So you think of uh, a sentence uh, specific to you. Mm -hmm. For example, Tom ate 27 pies and now he is fat, which is not very good. And then you take the first letter and all the special characters from the first letter of each word and all the special characters and numbers Mm -hmm. and it generates your password. So in our minds, we can remember the sentence because we've evolved over millions of years language. Um, But on paper, it looks like a very long string of random numbers, letters and special characters. And it's super secure. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, it's terrifying to know that Every different permutation of eight characters, or eight characters, special characters, letters, etc., can be run through in the space of two hours. That's, I mean, that 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 is really, really concerning. So, I guess you know, first off, that's the, like every possible password. Yes, that's under eight. Yeah. That's under eight characters. And I think most websites now just dictate that it needs to be a, a minimum of eight characters, one uppercase, and sometimes one special character. So, I'm going to guess most people will take the path of least resistance and choose exactly eight characters exactly one special character exactly one number as well most people do yeah i um i saw a uh what's it called a word storm where the uh, most common words are the biggest and the most common password apparently across the entire internet is password one capital p i can quite believe it so if you are listening and, you're, and you have the password password one with a capital p and i've just guessed it and i haven't got a, i'm you know tom is a different species to me when it comes to trying to hack in <laughs> but i've just guessed your password for for the love of god please go and change it from password one with a capital p you need to set at least 12 digits in your password um and i would not use english words i would put a little bit of slang in there or i would change it about if you're not going to mnemonically generate a password, try and make it as as random and not likely to be in a dictionary as possible. Got you. Okay, well, that's that's some good takeaways already for today. So keep you, your uh, keyless entry car keys inside of a Werther's Originals like tin and make sure that you've got a 12 a 12 digit password which isn't isn't pure english so getting back to the uh, the ethical hacking and the social engineering and stuff like that have you got some some cool stories some experiences that you've been through recently that you think some of the listeners might be interested to hear yeah i mean we can continue with the the attack on that large company and we can explain sort of certain uh, things pertaining to that 
So initially, we set up this meeting. Um, I, I created a product um, or a project that didn't exist, and I talked about it for an hour. I don't know how I did. It just all flowed out. <laughs> okay. um, but when I first arrived there, I asked to use the loo, um, and that was because I was given a visitor's pass, and the first thing I wanted to do was use my mobile phone to take photographs of that pass. Mobile phones now have got a resolution high enough to pretty much print out a pass and make it look relatively realistic. Um, I noticed that the uh, lanyard was a generic lanyard that you could buy off eBay. You could buy 20 different colours for like a tenner. Um, and I had a load of them in the back of my car. <laughs> so after the meeting, I went home. Um, I produced a new pass. I clicked the lanyard on. And the next day, I went in. I waited till they swapped for lunch, the people on the desk. And I just walked straight past, used the clone card that I had, um, accessed the room. Uh, I was drinking cups of coffee for a while. One of the, the stories within that is there was somebody photocopying on a photocopier and I started getting so bored of just sitting there. Um, I walked up to her and pretended I was from the photocopying company. So I walked up and I said, hi, it's Tom from the photocopying company. How is your machine behaving today? I've been told it's been a little bit naughty lately. And she said, yeah, yeah, last week it was a bit bad, but now it's working fine. And I said, cool, excellent. It's just like a courtesy call. Would you mind showing me the other photocopier in your, in your building? And she was like, yeah, sure, no problem. Now, why do you think I wanted her to show me? Uh, I knew to, where it was. All right, okay. Uh, to get access through the different doors, maybe, to where it was in the building? No, it was on the same floor. I've done why that. do you think? Try and think. Have a think. Do you want me to tell you? Tell me, come on. It was because I wanted to be seen being associated with that member of staff. Uh, so when she was walking across the floor with me, I was really loud. I was joking. I was talking. I was having a laugh. Mm. And people were looking. Mm. Look at that loud man over there. He's with Shirley or whatever her name was. Um, and that means within their mind, I'm meant to be there. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. This is a... Uh... Reputation by association type thing. Absol absolutely, absolutely. So a little bit later on, I actually got questioned off a, off a guy who was quite um, sort of security aware. Mm -hmm. And he come up and he's like, oh, how you what's your name? I'm like, oh, yeah, my name's Tom. Oh, where do you work? I says, oh, I work in IT. How long have you worked here for? It's a lovely building. He said, and, and I suddenly switched the conversation over to him mm. while people love talking about themselves. <laughs> so he spent about 15 minutes telling us about he worked there for 15 years. He was telling us all about his wife and his children and everything. And he completely forgot about questioning who I was. Um, in all that time, I was recording on my phone meetings between people exfiltrating information that way. I was planting devices like this, a little remote transmitter bug. Um, I can dial into it just on a mobile phone and you can listen to things going on in meeting rooms and things like that. Um, there's, I even installed one of these in one of the meeting rooms. It's just, I don't know if you can see it. Can you yeah, see yeah. that? Yeah, what is it? It's a, it's a cheapy little covert camera, but it transmits. So it can transmit a video feed. Okay. And what a what I've done is I wrote a little facial recognition system in Python. Um, and what it, what I do is I scrape the website for pictures of the employees and then I pop them into my little facial recognition system and link it with a little bit of information about them that I've already searched. And I wear a cap with a camera in it. Yeah. Mm. And I wear one of, one of these, which is a little covert headset and that bit there goes underneath your shirt mm -hmm. and those are two tiny 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 little magnets don't know if you can see them yeah, yeah yeah there's a big one in the middle and those tiny little ones drop inside your ear canals and then roll down to your eardrum inside your head and it uses um oh my god <laughs> yeah it's a bit minging it uses induction to vibrate them against your eardrum right. and you can you can hook it up to take an audio feed so what was happening is I was walking along, the camera was picking up their faces, sending the feed to the computer. The computer was recognizing their face, and then it was speaking in my ears who they were and which department they were in. So without even knowing them, 
I knew who they were. Does that make sense? Fucking hell, Tom. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so scary. <laughs> it's a little bit. Oh, wow. It only took me two nights to write that facial That's recognition system. That's absolutely blown my mind. You've scraped the website for all of the different employees, then you've linked that to a camera in your hat, and you've put tiny little magnets to... Re- so I'm going to guess the reason for the magnets is that a typical earpiece would be too conspicuous. And absolutely. This is completely covert, totally invisible. This is inside of your ear canal. Yeah, now I can tell you a funny story about it. It actually got stuck in me left ear. Oh, God. Okay. And, and that little magnet in the middle, you meant to extract them out of your ears. Okay, yeah, so it jumps and catches the magnet. Right? Yeah, and it, and it wasn't working. So I spent like a day and a half with this magnet stuck in my ear canal, <laughs> and I couldn't hear. <laughs> and I was thinking, I'm going to have to go to hospital. But uh, I had a, a, a huge fishing magnet. I don't know if you've seen them before. Yeah, I know People use them. Yeah, yeah. And I stuck it against the side <laughs> of my head and it went, <laughs> and it sucked it out. And it was covered in all sorts of wax and horrible stuff. Oh, but yeah, I got it out of my ear. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad that you've got it out of your ear. But I mean, that, <laughs> that, that sort of, that, the sophistication of that's really terrifying. And the other thing as well, obviously, <laughs> the, the implication is that if you're doing it as a white hack, a white hat, then the black hat hackers uh, or people that are doing this for um, corporate espionage and stuff like that. Like if you're, I don't know, the the top boffins in Apple, let's say, and you're designing the new iPhone and Samsung or Huawei, it's, let's say Huawei, the Chinese are always up to something in technology at the moment, aren't they? Everyone's worried about that. Um and they can put all of these different bits of technology in the meeting room and they know all the different bits and pieces or they put some sort of keyboard key uh, keystroke tracker on someone's so they can hack into the back end of all of the communication channels and you know you're 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 just a you're just a guy that's doing this if you had the weight of an entire comp- uh, like government behind you what what can they do then nation states are on a whole new level a whole new level have you heard of stuxnet uh, I've heard the name. I don't know why. What is it? Stuxnet, um, without going into too much technical detail, it was a, a, a virus that had infected a large volume of computers across the globe. Um, and it took Symantec several weeks to work out what this virus was. Normally, it takes them about 10, 15 minutes to say, oh, this is a worm. This is this. This is how it works. This is how it propagates. But Stuxnet... They didn't know what it was for a long time. It had bits of code that they didn't know what it was and and how it worked. And it was infecting computers on a level that they'd never seen before. Um, It was infecting USB sticks, removable media, transferring it everywhere. And it wasn't doing anything. Yeah. Oh, right. And they were okay. like just sitting there being being very intimidating. <laughs> uh, no, it was being very quiet. That's the scary thing about yeah, it. Okay, yeah. And it turned out it was looking for one system. Um, and that system was the Iranian nuclear enrichment program. And this bug was so sophisticated, it had four zero days in it. And a zero day is worth about a million dollars. It's like a hole, an unknown hole in an operating system or a service. Okay. And this had four in it, which pointed to nation state. And what it done when it found um, this power plant, all this unknown code was to control the industrial controllers of the factory. So what it done is it recorded... Uh, stats covertly of the factory for about 30 days. It then disabled the safety mechanisms because they were all through a computer. And then it replayed the good stats. So do you know like in films where they they, they capture a bit of footage and then they loop that footage while they commit a crime Mm -hmm. on a CCTV camera? Mm -hmm. Well, this was doing doing it on a nuclear enrichment system. So once it was playing back the good stats, it started speeding up and slowing down all the centrifuges until it exploded and it blew up thousands of centrifuges, physically exploded. This actually happened? When was this? This actually happened uh, 2009-ish, I think. I might be wrong. Wow. I'm not uh, I'm not massively au fait with news and stuff like that, so I very well might have missed it, but that is terrifying. And obviously the, the implications are that could be for pretty much, you know, if they can get into the Iranian nuclear enrichment plant, 
Like what? What really is left after that? What's got more security than that? <laughs> well, the scary thing was is it wasn't even connected to the internet. Okay, right. So it's so totally the, off, totally offline, totally. Yeah, it was isolated. called air, air gapped. So that's why they were infecting removable media. So one person plugged that stick into that computer, and that system was doomed. Absolutely doomed. I mean, there's there's amazing things which happen all of the time. This device that I showed you before, the little uh, radio transceiver, um, there was a guy called Barnaby Jack who was a New Zealand-based uh, ethical hacker. Uh, he was the guy who used to hack bank machines, and he could dial something into his phone, and then the bank machine would put jackpot on the screen and start emptying the cassettes of its money. <laughs> yeah, he, he was a showman, an absolute showman, super genius. Um, he discovered that... Um, pacemakers and morphine pumps um, were and insulin pumps, a lot of them, not all of them, uh, were susceptible to an SDR attack. So he potentially could defibrillate the person by pressing enter on his keyboard oh from God. about 100 yards away. Um, and he approached the big uh, company and companies and said, look, you know, this is a major security flaw. And they said, we're not interested. Um, so he was going to sort of tell everyone how it was done at a big convention, and unfortunately he died before the convention. Was that a suspicious death? Who knows? Well, he, he died. He died. He died of a, a drug overdose of a speedball of drugs two days before his big convention, so I'm led to believe of what I've read. Wow. And he was just a young guy, he wasn't like... He was a young guy, he was famous, he had an amazing career, beautiful family, you know, he had it all. Wow. I mean, this... Money, cars. It's weird, isn't it? Like, when we talk about all of this stuff, it, it's it's fascinating, really, I, I love learning about it, and it's really interesting, but there's just, when you finish laughing about whatever the point is, and you remember, if this gets into the, the hands of the wrong people, if this is used on the wrong sort of facility, it's the implications are really scary, aren't they? Make no like make no doubt about it, yeah? This is is in the hands of the wrong people. Yeah? They have it now, they use it now. And what gets me is the media tend to demonize hackers. Yeah. We're, we're told like uh, they, they tell everyone that we are the bad guys. We are, the hackers are the good guys. The cyber criminals are the bad guys. They're the ones who, if you, how can I put it? Is an analogy right? Okay, think of Gordon Ramsay and yeah. Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Gordon Ramsay will use a knife to cook you a meal, yep. and it'll be beautiful. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey Dahmer would use a knife to kill you and eat you. Yep. Yeah, that knife is hacking. Does that make sense? Yes. And then Gordon Ramsay's the hacker and Jeffrey Dahmer's the cyber criminals. And that's the best way to sort of to explain it to the layman so they understand, understand that there is a battle between good and evil constantly. Same, same tool but different direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So going on to – we touched on it earlier on, the, the stuff to do with nation states and, and things like that. Just how much power and resources do you think – countries are throwing into this both on the defense and on the offense side obviously i've listened to i don't know how much you listen to joe rogan but he he often has yeah, a couple has, has a couple of guys on from the cia and the fbi who are now retired and they talk about huawei and samsung tvs being installed with these particular chips and uh the back doors and the chinese having government officials working inside of every big company and all this sort of stuff all the time uh, absolutely absolutely to me, you've got to understand that data now is worth more than oil, yeah? So data about people, big data to train machine learning algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. It's worth more than oil. So it's it's a very, very valuable resource that people want. Um, so they're going to put a lot of money into securing that, and they're going to put a lot of money into defending that. Now, I'm genuinely proud of, of, of living in England and in Britain because – we have some of the best security professionals in the world, genuinely. Is that true? Um, absolutely true. Absolutely true. Um, they don't make a big thing about it. And that's 
what's great about it. Probably a good sign. Big thing. Yeah, <laughs> you've got some amazing, amazing people, absolutely unbelievable people protecting us now. And it, and it genuinely does blow my mind. Um, but you have a lot of threat actors as well. So you've got China, you've got Russia, you've got North Korea, you've got all the states that wouldn't necessarily get on with us politically. And you have to understand that for the price of one fighter plane, you can hire 200 hackers. Do you get my point? So information warfare is going to be the future of war. It's as simple as that. If you don't spend the money, you're not going to be able to defend against it. And do you need to spend a lot to be able to defend effectively? I can't quantify that because I, I don't know mm. enough about it. But I know that you have to spend some money yep. and especially invest in education and, and teaching people and making people aware. Um, you've got to remember that all the meddling in the elections in the US and everything was all, all the email leaks and everything was all based upon a phishing campaign, which was a social engineering attack. So, you know, it was once said that uh, hackers use technology, but the professionals hack the person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we've just got to, everybody needs to do the bit, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. We're entering into an information age. We all have mini supercomputers attached to us at the hip, you know. For it, we Google things like, you know, you don't know the answer. You just Google it straight away and you know the answer. Mm -hmm. it, it's there. We are now integrating more and more and more with technology. And if we don't protect that and if we don't look after ourselves, you know, we're going to be eating for breakfast, in my opinion. Does this need to happen at a state level or are there things that at an individual level which we all should be doing as well, apart from 12-string passwords and not using the <laughs> password, password one? I, I think I think governments do have a responsibility to protect us. Um, that's what they're elected for. And uh, so far, I think the UK have done a fantastic job. You know, there is going to be attacks all the time, but how many they stop and how many they defend against it, you know, we will never know. Mm. But they are doing their bit. Um, but I think common sense is a big thing. You know, don't just have super complex passwords, but just don't share them between all sorts of different platforms. Because if I get your LinkedIn, there's a very good chance your email is going to have the same password as your LinkedIn or something similar. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to target your email because then I can recover all your passwords to your email from all your other accounts. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Remember a few things. Whatever you put on the internet will always remain on the internet. There's no getting rid of it. It's going to be there. It's going to be spidered. It's going to be captured. Um, if you're using IoT devices, so Internet of Things like um, CCTV cameras and things like that, buy them from reputable places. You know, do your homework. Um, if you're buying a camera from China, that's 20 quid. And the same one in, from a, a British manufacturer or whatever is 150 quid. There's a reason why. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, that reason tends to be the fact that the, the rubbish, the crap, they don't protect you. In fact, the very devices that we use to protect us sometimes works in the favour of the cyber criminals. One of my demonstrations is something called Google Dorking. Have you heard of Google Dorking? No, take us through it. Really, really simple technique. It's um, using advanced search operators in Google to look for misconfigured systems right. um now anybody can do it without any technical capabilities whatsoever um they just need to know where to look now i'm not going to tell you where to look but it's okay. called it's called google hacking yep. if you're interested in looking yep. um and you can put in a string and you can exfiltrate um broken cameras or cameras when i say broken i mean cameras that aren't set up correctly mm -hmm. now with one line of code i can find 500 web cameras that I can log into. Some of them are CCTV cameras. So, you know, it's it's really, really scary stuff. It is scary stuff. I, some of the listeners will know I had uh, Roger McNamee, who was one of the early investors in Facebook, personal advisor to Mark Zuckerberg. He was the, the guy that got Sheryl Sandberg on board. Um, 
Then uh, just before that, I spoke to Professor David Carroll, who was the man, yeah. the professor from The Great Hack uh, on Netflix. Spoke to both of those guys within a couple of days of each other. And um, it definitely does feel at the moment like everything is gathering pace and the the online attacks or the online threats are just, they're increasing in their magnitude across all all platforms, as far as Absolutely. I'm concerned. So it's it's not just that you have this sort of below the line underground black hat hacker things that are going on but also even the data which we're willingly giving away is being manipulated in more more and more sophisticated ways and you know it, it really is it's getting it's getting more serious isn't it it absolutely is all these uh apps like uh the t- uh, face app and the 10 year puberty challenge mm-hmm. 10 year puberty challenge was used to capture data of people 10 years ago and now so they can build a machine learning model that machine learning model potentially could be used for face app to predict better aging of people and that's why you take a photograph of yourself and it ages you because it's all based on a data set yeah so it's it's scary stuff i've just sent you um a little link that i've just pulled up on a google doc okay um and this is actually a misconfigured cctv camera right. on um a university in america okay so, so you've just, just done it you've just done a live hack there and now i've clicked on this link i won't say where it is and fantastic. now and now i can i wow i can actually pan left and right and, tilt, and you can zoom in as and well. tilt this camera up and down. I can see people walking around. Tom, this is fucking terrifying, mate. <laughs> You've just That's I can nothing. See, so I can see this. I can see this student walking towards class. He's got a hoodie on. He's got his hands in the hoodie. And there's some people. Some guys sat down having a a, a Starbucks just on this thing here. And I can zoom myself back so I can have a little bit wider of a look. <laughs> Oh my god! Can I put my smug face on now, please? You've, you've already, you've already, <laughs> no, that, you've already that is, got it. That is so simple that anybody can do without any coding skills, without anything. It's just creative Google searching. Um, a while back, the uh, somebody using Google Docking found all of the uh, firmware and the software for all of the Boeing planes, I believe. Oh my god. Um, including the new 7771 um, that, you know, they found all of the source code for the plane. So it, although it doesn't take much to master, it's a very, very powerful little tool. It is. And I suppose the thing as well is that as the effectiveness and the power of the systems that we're using increase, the concern with someone do it using that for a nefarious purpose is it goes up in line with that right so naval ravikant there's an unbelievable podcast that i'll send to you once we're done actually it's rob reed from the after on podcast with naval ravikant yeah. uh, i'll put it in the show notes below for anyone who wants to listen as well they'll have heard me mention it before um basically talks about all of the different ways that they're concerned about the future, all the different ways that the world could end as far as they were concerned. They go through uh, SynBio, the synthetic biology stuff, which they're fucking terrified about. That includes nanotechnology. Uh, no, they, absolutely. That, that stuff's really worrying. There's some, some stuff to do with um, being able to deploy drones with tiny amounts of C4 in them out the back of a plane and then those drones are attached to facial recognition software and as opposed to dropping a big nuclear bomb on a on a city whereby it would make the city uninhabitable for a few years they could just drop 20,000 of these little drones out these drones would detect all of the people all of the men or all of the black men or all of the white women or all of the the people that voted one particular way facial recognition tiny little penny-sized amount of uh, plastic explosive, fly up to them straight in the middle of the forehead, just blow the head off. Great defence against that. Either wear a mask or have a bloody good tennis racket with you. Big tennis racket. I'd back myself. I'd back, I've got a strong forehand, so I'd back myself with the tennis racket. All the tennis players would be safe. I know they would. Andy Murray's sweet, isn't he? Andy Murray and all of his family are the safest people in all of the UK. But yeah, they're talking about all of this stuff. And one of the things that's really interesting, it, it, it kind of rounds this discussion off nicely, I guess, with regards to some... Uh, um, some of the importance of what we're talking about with regards to data security at the moment. What they say is that in the past, 
the most damage that anybody could have done two, three hundred years ago. The most damage anybody could have done would have been shot one person once out of a musket and then that would have been it. That was really the peak of what we could do. Maybe hit someone with a cannonball, but that was fairly fairly inaccurate. And as technology grows and as these weapons and as the um, the delegation uh, and the... Uh, <clears throat> How would you put it? The ability for people to understand how to do destructive things becomes more and more well understood and then more and more well distributed. It means that it won't be long before someone will be able to... They're already doing it. 3D printing guns. There we go. Perfect example. You've got technology with some coding that's come together. You can 3D print a gun. How long before you can 3D print a bomb of some kind or you know all of these things? So I suppose what that means is we need to be even more security conscious because the stakes of getting it wrong increasingly get worse and worse absolutely I, I mean that rounds it up lovely you know as things are progressing we're going to be faced with lots of new challenges and if we don't adapt as a race we're going to end up destroying ourselves i mean now you know it's possible very unlikely but it's possible for a rogue hacker to shut down a power plant or to um do a ransomware attack on a on a water treatment factory and and flood the water with loads of chlorine or, you know, there's so many different things you can do that are damaging with technology now. And if we don't stay one step ahead of it, if we don't have a good educational system and and people to inspire young minds and to to get them involved in being a white hat and an ethical hacker, you know, we're going to be in a world of hurt. We genuinely are. Are you guys, I'm going to guess the answer is yes, but you guys will be paid fairly well for your services. It will be a specialized uh, and small group of people who have skills up to the standard that are required. Well, the average wage for a a qualified penetration tester with a bit of experience uh, is between 65 and 120,000 pounds a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is going to be a 1.8 million job deficit within the next three years. So nobody will have the skill set to do that. Um, my suggestion would be, if you want a career change, do what I've done. You know, quit your minimum wage job, blag yourself into university and smash it the best you possibly can. Jump in head first, take on every opportunity, do the best you possibly can and change your life because you can do it. Tom, what an unbelievable way to end the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on, man. If uh, if anyone who is listening wants to learn a little bit more, are there any blogs that you like or have you got anything online? Uh, I'm, are you on Twitter? Is, is... Uh, no, I'm very careful on what I go on online, believe it or not. <laughs> I imagine, I thought, for some reason I was, uh, I thought that you might say that. I'm a tad paranoid. I only got a phone about a month ago. Okay, okay, fair <laughs> yeah, enough. Yeah, um, what I would suggest is if you want to learn more, Uh, Get yourself on Hack the Box. It is a website designed to teach hacking and you can legally hack their networks um, that allow you to do it and have different capture the flag challenges, things Uh, like that. You've got over the wire war games. Have a go at that. Um, Learn Kali Linux the best you can. And if you're a student or you've got access to an academic email, get yourself on uh, Mercer Labs. Um, which was set up in conjunction with our sort of GCHQ technical sort of departments of the government. Um, and they have sort of labs that you can learn on there as well. And you can have a so little play around, play around in these safe environments where you can do a little bit of hacking, see if you're any good, and then maybe flog your skills for 120 grand a year. Absolutely. Absolutely. Unbelievable. Yeah, I, do you know what it is? I don't, I don't think that we could have done a better recruitment video if we tried. Tom, <laughs> uh, links to everything that we've spoken about today, uh, Naval Ravikant on Rob Reed's After On, links to Hack the Box Over the Wire and some of the other bits and pieces we've gone through will be in the show notes below. As always, if you enjoyed this, please don't forget to give us a like and hit subscribe. It really does make me happy. Tom, man, thank you so much. I'm, I, I'm really excited to see what happens next. I guess we'll have to wait a couple of years until the, you've non-disclosure agreement probably frees up and you can actually talk about it but yeah what an awesome day thank you so much man fantastic thank you mate yeah. Yeah.